Um, well, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the Governor's Conference on the Future of Water in Kansas um, and the Reservoir Sedimentation Breakout Session. Uh, my name is Laura Totten. I'm with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'm a planner and a project manager in the planning branch. And uh, this morning we have four or five presenters who will be presenting uh, different um, presentations primarily focused on reservoir sedimentation. So it, I think it'll be a, a really interesting session uh, this morning. Just a few housekeeping things that I wanted to go over first. Um, we'd like to request that you uh, mute your microphone if you're not speaking and you know, if possible, turn off your video uh, during the presentations, unless you're presenting, so that it, it um, you know, it tends to reduce the bandwidth if everybody's on video, um, and that it helps to avoid distractions. Um, there are a few features in Zoom that will allow you to interact with each other or with the presenters, um, and that would be the chat function. So, Hopefully you're all able to find that chat function and can can either ask, you can start to ask questions of the presenters as uh, they're going through their presentation that we, that we will then hold until the end of the presentation. Uh, you know, or you can, if you see somebody you know, you can chat with them, but please try to keep your chat professional uh, and focused on the presentation. Um, as I said, questions will be held to the end of each presentation, but, uh, like I said, feel free to use the chat function. Also, I uh, wanted to mention that PDH hours are, are available. Um, if you'd like to sign up for these credits, you can visit the K uh, Kansas Water Office website and navigate to the PDH credit form on the governor, governor's conference page. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce the first set of presenters and Brian, um, Alan Chestnut, I don't know that I had a bio for you. Well, I think, yeah, yours is in with Brian's. So we have two presenters this morning um, for our first presentation, and uh, that would be Alan Chestnut and Brian Trombley with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Kansas City Branch. Brian Trombley graduated from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2006 with a bachelor's degree in biological systems engineering and in 2008 with a master's degree in agricultural and biological systems engineering. He began to work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Omaha District Water Control and Water Quality Section in 2009. In this role, his primary responsibilities were reservoir regulation and forecasting and support to the NWO stream gauging program in 2015, he moved to the Kansas City District Water Management Section and continues to work there. Primary responsibilities are reservoir regulation, forecasting, and support to planning studies. Brian lives in the Kansas City area with his wife and three children. He is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Nebraska. Alan Chestnut studied, studied civil engineering at Kansas State University where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in 2009. He started work with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Kansas City District in 2007 in the hydrology and hydraulic section. He has also worked for short times in various construction offices for the Corps. In 2014, he attended Colorado State University where he graduated with a master's of science degree in civil engineering hydraulics. He currently serves as a senior hydraulic engineer for the Kansas City District hydrology and hydraulic section, as well as managing the floodplain management services program. His duties include a variety of hydrologic and hydraulic engineering, as well as project management. He is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Kansas, as well as a certified floodplain manager. Alan resides with his family in Mission, Kansas. So Brian, Alan, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Laura. Can can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Um, sorry if there's a little background noise. <laughs> um, uh, so, like Laura said, um, happy to be here. Happy to be talking about Kansas River. And the title of my presentation, or of our presentation today, is "If We Do Nothing: The Future of Kansas Reservoirs Without Very Intentional Intervention." Um, all. All of this work has been done as part of the, the Kansas watershed study. 
And so today I'd like to just start with an overview of the Kansas watershed study. And then I'll, I'll talk about the reservoir simulation model that we've used for that and uh, future sediment estimates, the impacts of those future conditions on, on the reservoirs and on the river system. And then finally, Alan's gonna talk about the climate change analysis. So the Kansas watershed study is focused on three primary areas, flood risk management, sediment management, and reservoir operations. And those all, of course, interact with one another, as well as with many other opportunity areas that we're looking at, as listed here, um, looking at infrastructure investment, water supply, water quality, recreation and ecosystem preservation and restoration. The watershed study is, um, covers the entire Kansas River Basin and we are looking at opportunities within that entire basin, although the, the primary focus is in the Kansas portions of the river. The reservoir modeling that I've been doing as part of the watershed study is, is utilizing the Hydrologic Engineering Center Reservoir Simulation Model, or, or I call it HEC Res Sim. And we're modeling the lower seven reservoirs in the Kansas River system. So Wakanda, Wilson, Canopolis, Milford, Tuttle Creek, Perry, and Clinton. And looking at how that how changes in those reservoirs impact the river system, whether it be for flooding or low flow. We also model a portion of the Missouri River because of the Kansas lakes operating for flow targets on the Missouri River. So this slide shows the river system just as a stick figure. And each one of these reservoirs, so this is just looking at the lower Kansas river, including the, the lower four lakes on the tributaries. And these are the four we operate as the Kansas system, as we call it. So the, we have several gauges along the river that are, that are noted here that are used as flood control targets. And then we also have some low flow targets that I'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, I will note on the flood targets, I, I did mention uh, Waverly um, we know about a lot from several recent floods that Waverly has had high flows and constrained the Kansas releases. So I have highlighted the, the flows there. But for today, I'd also like to talk about the low flow targets at Topeka and DeSoto. When there is minimal runoff, we'll make releases to target 750 CFS at Topeka and 1,000 CFS at DeSoto. And there is the opportunity to lower those releases if, especially as the Tuttle Creek pool elevation drops, um, Topeka can go as low as, as 600 CFS and uh, DeSoto can go as low as 700 CFS in certain situations. So moving to the sediment analysis, uh, this was conducted by John Shelley and the Reservoir and River Engineering Group in the Kansas City District. And they were doing this work again as part of the Kansas Watershed Study. And John will be presenting later, but not specifically on this, this work that he did. Uh, this slide talks about the percent of the remaining multipurpose pool at the end of 25, 50, and 100 years. So each of these, um, these lakes are shown, and then there's also a, a number with it. So the first number is the 25 year, the second number is the 50 year uh, percent of flood pool remaining, and the last one is the 100 year. Um, so in my example here, Wilson uh, loses some sediment over the course of several years, but, but not a large impact. However, at Canopolis, at the end of 100 years, only 10% of the flood of the multi-purpose pool is remaining. Um, and then also large impacts at Tuttle Creek where uh, really all usable storage is gone at the end of 50 years. 
and then by the end of a hundred, it's it's virtually zero, no no multi-purpose at all remaining, and then also some pretty large impacts at Perry where half of the flood pool is gone at the end of 50 years and we're down to 25% at the end of, of 100 years. And just a second, I forgot to plug in. All right. So, so and as you can see at Tuttle Creek, we also have, have a, a reservoir area showing. And here's the, the current, the blue line is the current area of the Tuttle Creek multi-purpose pool. And you can see this kind of orange red line is the projected Tuttle Creek multi-purpose pool area at the end of a hundred years. So just, just a puddle behind the dam. Now, again, these numbers are all associated with the multi-purpose pool. There is also the flood control pool, which has less sedimentation since there's since water isn't there as often, so it doesn't accumulate sediment as often. But at the the three lakes that have the most impact, Perry and Canopolis both lose about 6% of their flood control pool at the end of 100 years, and then Tuttle is closer to 14%. And that may be low, considering that the multi-purpose pool would be full and, and perhaps there would be an increased sedimentation uh, after that condition, depending how the lake is operated. So I, um, so John's group provided uh, elevation and storage curves as well that I've plotted here. And for this presentation, I'll mainly just look at Milford, Tuttle Creek and Perry and how they impact the, the lower Kansas River. Uh, but as you can see, Milford, the, the storage curves are um, not changing a lot over the 100 years, just small loss of storage. But at Tuttle Creek, um, the blue line is our current sediment condition. And each scenario gets progressively and significantly worse, progressing to the 100 year scenario where we're at, at virtually no storage, even up into the lower regions of, of the flood control pool. And then at Perry, it's a similar story, although not as dramatic, but still some significant loss. And with each of these plots, I'm just showing the, the multi-purpose pool and then some of the lower portions of the flood control pool. So moving on now to the, the reservoir modeling and the impacts of, of the um, increased sedimentation. I do need to talk a little bit. So I, uh, we created a hundred year record of data. We had to extend some of the gauges and some of the inflow records, but there was data for the past hundred years in, um, in, in several of the gauges in the basin. So we took that data and shifted it forward 103 years and then created a simulation, um, four different simulations for the 0, 25, 50, and 100 year sediment conditions. So the only change, all the inflows are the same, all the river flows are the same. The only change is the uh, reservoir sedimentation condition. And uh, we observed small impacts to the flood control operations. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't large trends there, but significant impacts to the low flow scenarios. So for um, the next few slides, I'm gonna show each of the three lakes and then Topeka and DeSoto. And I'll show um, a flood scenario and a drought scenario, just to show what some of the, the data looked like that I was getting out of the model. So this is the Tuttle Creek pool elevation. And so you can see there's not a clear trend, but Let's see, so the green line is the zero year condition, um, the zero year sediment condition, which is equivalent to 2024, which is the end of the, the watershed study. Um, the red line is the 25 year, yellow is the 50 and blue is the 100 year. So during, well, this event, which is the equivalent of the 1993 flood event, 
Um, we do have some increased pool elevations early, but uh, as the flood progresses, the pool elevation really isn't impacted by the sedimentation. It's not significantly impacted. Although releases would be adjusted. But um, now we get into a drought scenario. And I, I hesitate to share this because the data isn't real clean, but, but what it tells is that uh, the reservoir is, has various impacts um, in the 0, 25, 50-year scenario. But at the 100, the blue line is um, all operational use of the lake has gone. And we're down to about 1,000 acre feet of storage. So any release quickly drops the reservoir to zero storage. Then any inflow, we're bouncing back up and just kind of bouncing between zero storage and the conservation pool. So um, we probably wouldn't operate it like that. We'd probably just uh, let the little puddle stay there. But this is what would happen if we tried to operate it for, um, for some operational use, like meeting a water quality target. So at Milford, a similar no large impacts due to um, on the flood pool. But in the drought scenario, there is some significant impact with, uh, with a, a pool, well, releases needing to be made from Milford to meet water quality targets, specifically at, DeSoto, or at, at Topeka. And uh, there's a fluctuation here at the zero year down to uh, 40 feet lower at the 100 year. And Milford is getting low on, on storage at that point as well. So almost all the Milford storage would be necessary to even try to meet water quality targets. And Perry, a very similar story. Not, not a large trend in the flood pool, but during the drought scenario, again, um, loss of, actually at Perry, loss of all usable storage also in the 100 year scenario, um, but also significant losses in the other years. And that's, again, just to meet water quality targets, specifically the Soto. So then looking at Topeka, this is, this is the flood scenario. And uh, there is some slightly higher flows in the 100 year at the, at the peak which could be because more water has to be passed through a spillway, but, but not a large trend. And then on the low flow side, mind you, I'm showing about two years worth of data here. So I know it's a busy slide, but this black dashed line shows our water quality target. And we are generally meeting the water quality needs until the worst part of the drought when at the 100 year where you know, flows are approaching zero or bouncing up as, as some small inflow events come into Tuttle Creek. So at the 100 year, we begin to have problems meeting our water quality target at Topeka. And also at DeSoto, very similar trend through the, the flood scenario. And at the low flow, so um, again, the dashed line is our water quality target at DeSoto of 1,000 CFS. And we drop a little bit below that, but I think in the, on the green, yellow, and red lines, but I think some of that is because of permissible lowering of flood targets. But in the 100 year, it's just bouncing around and making it very difficult to meet water quality targets. And now I'll turn it over to Alan Chestnut for discussion on the climate change assessment. Okay, can you hear me, Brian? Yes. Great. Uh, so I just have a couple slides here to, to hit on uh, kind of the projected impacts of climate change in the Kansas River Basin. <clears throat> Some of these are a little bit more general. Um, I think most of us heard Doug uh, Cluck from the National, or from National Oceanic from NOAA yesterday talk about um, climate change impacts in Kansas. So some of these uh, are the same things that you, you saw from him, that uh, lower middle figure there is the same figure he was showing. Um, so what we did for the, the watershed study here in the Kansas Basin, um, we follow our 
um, qual our guidance for qualitative climate change assessment, and that's in uh, one of our engineering and construction bulletins. Um, so really, it's a qualitative look at what the impacts of climate change um, on project purposes might be. And uh, we don't really get, delve into the quantitative stuff too much. The next slide I'm going to show has some quantitative stuff on it, but keep in mind that it's really not designed to be a projection that uh, you can pull numbers off of. So um, generally what we found with the literature review is that, yeah, we're seeing that increases in precipitation and uh, temperature are likely under projected climate change. Uh, like Doug was hitting on yesterday, some of that has already been observed. And uh, going forward, <clears throat> we're projecting that there are uh, further um, increases in those. Uh, there's also uh, the potential for increased uh, extreme storm events, droughts, and uh, larger storm events as well. Um, all of that to say, it's still pretty uncertain what the impacts to uh, stream flow are. Um, you would expect that uh, increased precipitation would it lead to increased stream flow. Uh, some of the things that Doug was talking about yesterday apply though, such as um, we get more evapotranspiration, um, losses of water from the watershed when we uh, get into those higher temperature scenarios too. So uh, kind of that, that figure on the right, you're seeing uh, the, the bottom line, we're showing hydrology or stream flow. Yeah, we're expected on that, the right side in the blue. The projection is there's probably some increase, uh, but the consensus in the literature is pretty low. Uh, so there's still just a lot of uncertainty there. You want to go to the next slide, Brian? So another thing that we looked at for the, um, the watershed study with the climate change analysis is uh, trends in the projected stream flow. So do we expect that the the stream flows are going to significantly change? And the the tool that we have on this uh, currently looks out to the year 2100. Um, so over on the right side there, you're seeing kind of the spread in the data that the blue line on the on the plot on the right is is the mean, I think, of the of the data sets. Um, but there's 93 different projections there. So they're running different climate models. And then the, the data gets run through the uh, variable infiltration uh, capacity model um, to project the, the stream flows. Uh, none of this is run through a reservoir model at this time. So it's, it's just kind of raw, raw volume data out for the, for the model. And it's looking at monthly annual um, Sorry, the monthly maximum for each year. Um, so the, the the yellow background, you're just showing that there's a big spread in the data. Uh, the blue line's the mean again. And then over on that figure on the right, or sorry, the left, you're seeing the projected trend in that data. So the, the gray is kind of the hindcast data um, back to 1950. And they're showing that there's an upward trend in both of them. Um, the uh, p-value there for the statistics um, isn't statistically significant for the, the data back from before 2000. And then that uh, p-value is pretty low for that projected data for the, this is the Kansas River uh, HUC 1027. Uh, we looked at four digit HUCs for this. So there's, there's three of those in the, in the watershed. But for this one, it looks like there is a statistically significant upward trend um, again, this is not quantitative. It's really just um, a projection based on the climate modeling that we've got. So, oh, also the yeah, the Republican uh, River Basin, Huck 1025, also showed the, the same trend. Whereas the the Smoky Hill Basin, um, I think there was an upward trend, but it wasn't showing as statistically significant. So, that's all I've got. All right, well, thank you, Brian and Alan. Um, there, there is about maybe two minutes left for questions. If anyone would like to ask one now, maybe one question. Uh, but I would like to say that, you know, feel free to put questions in the chat. I don't know, Brian and Alan, if you're gonna stick around in this breakout for a while, but um, people can still put some questions in the chat and uh, maybe Brian and Alan could respond back or, um, you can always send your questions through, um, I guess, the water office. 
and um, they can forward the, your question to the speaker to answer at their discretion. So I would just let for the next couple of minutes, does anyone have any questions for Alan uh, or Brian? There's some in the chat. For some reason, okay, wait, I do have a few here. So there is a question um, from Hakeem Saadi. Uh, would you say the loss of conservation pool storages in Tuttle, Milford and Perry occurred mostly over the last 30, 40, or five years. Maybe that uh, meant to be 50 years, I'm not sure, but. That is 50, correct. Okay. Thank you. So Brian, I think that's a question for you, um, or maybe John Shelley, if he's on. And John probably would be the better one, so jump in if you want, John, if you're available, but. <clears throat> um, so the the last several years we and we've been losing some storage but it's just projected to um, continue so uh, um, i think whatever trends we've been seeing so especially at tuttle creek and at canopolis uh, will continue so right now the storage the multi-purpose pool has plenty of storage to provide what it needs so um, haven't seen large impacts, but as that trend continues, we'll get to the critical point. All right, thank you. And then Gary Coons um, had a question asking, has USACE looked at the cost of pool recovery and how that might change over time? And I believe um, John is gonna talk about that later as far as some ideas about how to address the sediment conditions. And he has certainly looked at some of those costs. All right, thank you. And I will say for the, the watershed study that the US Army Corps of Engineers is working in partnership with on with the Kansas Water Office and the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, we're doing um, you know, assessments of these different things and looking at measures and strategies to address the issues and problems. So once that document becomes available for the public um, a year and a half into the future, there, there will be more information uh, on some of these things that we're looking at related to sedimentation. Um, but I will go ahead and move on to the next presenter. Um, the next presenter is Michael Mansfield with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The title of his presentation is, Can We Stop the Sediment Before It, it Enters the Lake? Uh, Michael Mansfield is a hydraulic engineer with the US, United States Army Corps of Engineers, Kansas City District River Engineering Section. Mr. Mansfield holds a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. He has analyzed riverbank erosion on small, medium, and large rivers and has designed mitigation measures for bank erosion. His other work experience includes wetland design, 1D and 2D river sediment modeling, and analysis of riverbed dynamics. So Michael, I, I do see your screen and uh, it's ready. Uh, Michael, your, your audio, the audio seems to be highly garbled. Or there, there you are, Michael. Okay, Go ahead. great. All right, well, just wanna say thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Michael Mansfield with the Army Corps of Engineers, Kansas City District, and I'm here to present findings from an analysis that looked into preventing sediment buildup within Tuttle Creek Lake. So here's an outline of what we'll be discussing today. 
We'll start with the location of Tuttle Creek Lake, and then we'll discuss the sediment buildup, kind of build on what Alan and Brian previously talked about. Um, we'll then look at two measures to prevent the sediment buildup within the lake. We'll look at bank stabilization, and then we'll look at grade control. Is this in the way for you guys? Let's move this. Okay. So uh, here's a location of uh, Turtle Creek Lake. It's located in northern, uh, the watershed is located in northern Kansas and southern Nebraska. Uh, the lake is located just outside of Manhattan, Kansas. Um, the watershed is approximately 10,000 square miles in area. Uh, now, unlike other major uh, dams in the area, Turtle Creek Lake has no major impoundments in the upstream area, in the upstream watershed. Um, so therefore the entire watershed contributes sediment. This is unique to uh, Tuttle as opposed to other lakes within the area. And this is a, a big contributor for why Tuttle is unique compared to the other lakes that Brian now just discussed. Um, some of the major tributaries that we'll be discussing today include the Big Blue River, the Little Blue River, and Fancy Creek. All right, so, so why does this matter? Um, now, as Brian just discussed, the multi-purpose pool is filling in with sediment. Uh, within 25 years, we expect the multi-purpose pool to be reduced just 25% of its original capacity and about half of its original surface area. Within 100 years, we expect it to be completely filled in. Now, the issue can be dealt with in one of two ways. The sediment could either be dealt with in the lake or it could be prevented from entering the lake in the first place. Now, I believe we'll hear from John in a little bit about uh, in-lake solutions, but just a, a little bit of precursor. One of the options would be dredging, um, but it's, dredging is a very costly endeavor and could have adverse environmental effects. Therefore, uh, we're going to be looking at if we can prevent the sediment from entering the lake in the first place, hopefully this would be a less intrusive option and hopefully a less expensive one. So where does all the sediment come from? There are really two options for where the sediment might be originating from. One is surface soil runoff, and then the other is channel bank erosion. And there have been several studies within, uh, within Kansas watersheds as far as where the sediment comes from, um, particularly one in 2007 by Kyle Yerichek and Ziegler was that in, in Perry Lake, they determined that channel bank erosion was a dominant source, although surface soil runoff did contribute substantially to uh, the sediment buildup within the lake. Um, and Perry Lake is a fairly uh, similar lake as far as the uh, you know, location and the size. So therefore, we believe that if we reduce the channel bank erosion that uh, is occurring in the upstream watershed, then uh, we would substantially reduce the sediment buildup within the lake itself. So in 2017, the Kansas Water Office identified 270 sites in the upstream watershed that uh, were considered erosion hotspots. And these erosion hotspots are uh, areas with more than 2,000 square feet of erosion. They compared aerial photographs from 2015 to, to photographs from either 1991, 2002, or 2003 to determine an area of erosion. They also used field investigations and LIDAR to determine the bank height so that they could determine overall volume, um, volume of sediment that uh, would be eroding. So this analysis uh, builds on that performed by the Kansas Water Office. We took into account two additional factors, deposition and the fines content. We took into account the fines content solely because the fines content constitutes the wash load. Now, sands and other bed material load will eventually end up in the lake, but this process could take many decades. Wash load, on the other hand, would take a, a very short amount of time to enter into the lake. There, and also some of the field investigations have confirmed that a lot of the sediment that's building up within Tuttle are silts and clays. Therefore, we only wanted to look at the fines content that would be eroding from these hotspots. We also took into account deposition on the inside bend. Typically erosion hotspots were found on the outside of a bend where you would see a pool forming, um, but on the opposite side where they're on the inside bend, there would be deposition. So we wanted to take that into account as well. So uh, we applied, we, we basically looked at 16 sites within the watershed to come up with an overall reduction factor. So we looked at 16 sites and calculated the fines content, calculated the deposition, and then we averaged this sort of reduction factor to apply to the entire watershed. After we did this, we determined that uh, bank stabilization at these hotspots would account for a little, a little under 1% of the entire volume of sediment that would be accumulating in Tuttle Creek Lake. So we saw a, 
a little less than 3,000 acre feet uh, was due to this these bank erosion hotspots. And within 25 years, uh, the Corps of Engineers predicts around 320,000 acre feet will deposit in Tuttle Lake. Therefore, this this method this uh, measure would account for a little under one percent of the sediment building up. <clears throat> we then performed a financial analysis. So once we had uh, determined the sediment reduction, we wanted to look at how cost effective these measures would be. Even though it's only a small amount of the entire sediment load, if it's more cost effective to deal with prior to entering the lake, then it would at least help us reduce some costs as opposed to in-lake solutions. Now, after doing this analysis, uh, this is over a 25 year period, um, we determined that the entire cost, if we wanted to stabilize every erosion hotspot that uh, was identified, then it would cost approximately $10 million. And the unit cost per cubic yard um, would be about $2.50. Um, and in comparison, dredging costs can be approximately $6.70. So even though it's not a substantial amount of the sediment load, it would be much more cost effective to deal with the sediment prior to entering the lake than dealing with it in the lake itself. Now, there, there are a couple of limitations on this analysis. Um, the first thing that we looked at was a hydrologic similarity. Um, so in, in this case, we looked at the number of days above bank full flow that were observed during the entire period of record versus those compared during the anal analyzed periods, which would be 1991, 2002, 2003, all the way to 2015. Um, for bank full flows, we took the flow above the uh, 1.2 year flow. And after doing this analysis, we determined that erosion may have been underpredicted because the total number of, or the average number of days above bank full flow during the analyzed period was less than the average number of days uh, per year above bank full flow for the entire period of record. So therefore, bank stabilization may be slightly more effective than predicted, and it could be a little bit less expensive per cubic yard. So after looking at bank stabilization measures, we turned our attention to grade control. Um, because bank uh, erosion really only uh, contributes a small amount of the sediment, we thought that grade control might be the answer to preventing the sediment from entering in the first place. Um, now head cuts have been observed within the Tuttle Creek watershed. Uh, Tuttle, uh, he head cuts refer to bed degradation that works its way upstream. Head cuts could be um, a result of any of the following could be channelization, which would shorten the channel length and increase the slope and thus have greater localized velocities and increase shear stresses. Uh, we could also see land use changes that would result in different runoff characteristics, which would thus change the morphology of the river. And then we, we can also see head cuts downstream of reservoirs uh, due to sediment starved conditions. Now, because head cuts deepen and widen the channel, very large amounts of sediment could be introduced to the system. If silts and clays are present, then these would be transported downstream uh, to be deposited into a floodplain, lake, or reservoir. And then here are just some mechanisms by which we could see that grade control might mitigate uh, a head cut um, in, in the bottom right hand corner. So here's the uh, uh, head cut sedimentation projection for Fancy Creek. Um, now, in order for us to estimate the amount of sediment that would result from these head cuts, we use the Fluvial Geomorph Toolkit, which was developed by the Army Corps of Engineers. This toolkit is a rapid watershed assessment toolkit that assesses channel instabilities using LIDAR or other elevation data sets. Empirical relations were then used to determine the stable channel dimensions, allowing for the identification of channel instabilities. So the process runs as follows. Step one. Use the Fluvial Geomorph Toolkit to identify potential head cuts in the selected reaches. We can see basically wherever we see that there's a, a little bit of a jump in the profile in the figures on the right, then that could be considered a channel instability. Uh, step two was to use the existing channel slopes. In this case, it would be like the downstream slopes um, from this level one analysis and uh, ch stable channel slopes from engineering manual 1418 to establish a range of possible future degradation. In this case, the yellow and green lines were the, uh, uh, the EM 1418 or the projected uh, downstream slopes. Um, 
Step three was to use the most conservative of these slopes in the calculations because there's very little known about these watersheds. We don't know where the bedrock was. We don't have exact uh, bed gradations throughout. So we're not exactly sure a lot of this um, was estimating. And so we, were, we just simply used the most conservative estimate. And then step four was to use the cross sections to derive a width adjustment factor. This width adjustment factor is used for our sedimentation calculations. It, it essentially accounts for as uh, channels deepen, they also widen. And so this width adjustment factor takes that into account. So the figures on this slide uh, are, are the analysis for Fancy Creek, um, which runs northwest from Tuttle, as you can see in the figure on the left. Um, so head cuts were identified, and the yellow and green lines are potential steady state slopes if grade control is not to be implemented. Here's that same analysis for McIntyre Creek. McIntyre Creek is significantly smaller than Fancy Creek. It's only about 18 square miles. Uh, Fancy Creek was about 181 square miles um, in its watershed area. And as you can see, the, the red circles on the figures on the right are potential channel instabilities on McIntyre Creek. And so those would be areas that we would look at for head cut, um, for, as potential head cut locations. Um, the red, yellow, and purple lines that you see projected out are the, that range of steady state slopes that the channel might eventually uh, work its way to. In, in this case, we use that red dotted line again as it was the most conservative slope, although field investigations would be necessary to determine if, that, uh, if we really should be using that something more conservative or less conservative. So that would allow us to have more confidence in our assumptions from using engineering manual 1418, which essentially uses bed gradations to determine an average steady state slope. So here are, the, here's, here are the results of that analysis. Um, the top uh, table are the results that are directly from Fluvio Geomorph. Um, so these would include like reach lengths, current bed characteristics, and projected bed characteristics. The bottom table calculates projected volumes of sediment based on these anticipated width adjustment factors. Um, the average volume of sediment released in, th in this case would be about 100 acre feet per mile. Um, for reference, that uh, we, we uh, identified about 19 potential head cuts located in the previous two slides. Um, and so when we calculate all that out, if we were to stabilize each of those head cuts, um, which may require more than one grade control structure, but just looking at it on a per head cut basis, that is identified about 97 acre feet per head cut. Um, so our preliminary findings indicate that channel degradation may be a major cause of the sediment buildup that is occurring within Tuttle Creek Lake. Again, field investigations are necessary to validate the assumptions that we used, such as the geologic controls, infrastructure impacts, and uh, channel and floodplain land use and plan form assessments. Now, here, here are just some bullet points to, to take away. Um, Tuttle Creek Lake is filling in with sediment and preventative measures are necessary to reduce that sediment buildup within the lake. Um, bank erosion at the identified hotspots only accounted for a very small amount of the deposition that we see within the lake. Um, further analysis is necessary to determine if the grade control will reduce the sediment buildup. Um, and then also just what one key point here is that head cuts also do cause the bank erosion that we saw, and we identify that bank erosion is only a small amount of the deposition, but head cuts would be much more dispersed than at specific um, bank erosion hotspots. So they would uh, be much more dispersed. And so we, we do still see um, bank erosion uh, with head cuts. It would just be more dispersed than that of the uh, erosion hotspots that we saw. I'd like to thank the Kansas Water Office um, for their previous analysis on this. Well, Todd and uh, John Shelley and Chris Herring also prover, um, provided some of the analysis for this. And then the Watts program, which provided some of the funding for uh, Dr. Chris Herring to, uh, to work on this. So I'd like to open it up for questions. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, there is one question in the chat that I'll go ahead and read first. Um, it's from Hakeem Saudi. Would any of these tools for head cut of sedimentation require USACE 404 permit uh, and costly mitigations? To simply use the uh, fluvial geomorph toolkit, or is he referring to stabilizing the head cuts? 
um, Hakeem. Yeah, maybe. this is Hakeem. Stabilizing the head cuts. Yeah, so I, I haven't looked at any of the permitting, so I would have to defer to somebody that uh, that is more qualified to answer for that. Because a lot of the head cuts occurs also up in the uh, the upstream, I guess uh, the uh, drainage area, and uh, mitigation really kind of kill the whole programs if you want to do anything. I guess that's the regulatory branch of the Corps of Engineers or so, the 404 permit and 401. Yeah, abso absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, if we were to take this to design, you know, we would have to go and do more field investigations. But yes, uh, we, we would certainly have to run that through a regulatory branch. And yeah, there, I, I wouldn't be able to give an answer as far as what, what exactly we need to do um, prior to that. One last clarification. Did you say <clears throat> the sediment from bank erosion is less than one percent at those or, identified erosion hotspots. Okay, okay, I, I agree with that because I think a lot of the sedimentation is coming from the, the upstreams there, the the tribs and semi and the uh, ephemeral streams and those are all that drains into Tuttle. Sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, we, we looked at like the Little Blue River, Big Blue River, Vermilion. Um, we looked at some big rivers some small rivers to try to get that overall reduction factor as, um, you know, as representative of the watershed as possible. Thank you. Mm. All right. Um, there is a, a question from Alan Chestnut. How quickly would you expect these adjustments in stream bed profile to occur? Does the toolbox address that? Ah, that is a very... Uh, difficult question that um, John might have to provide better feedback on. It's something that we've been discussing over the past couple of weeks as far as how to assess the um, uh, the, the velocity or like yeah, the, the speed of the head cut at which it's moving upstream. And so we would need repeat um, LIDAR data sets to identify that. Um, one option that we've looked into is um, we've seen several cutoffs within the area. Um, within the watershed. And so if we can identify when a head, when a cutoff occurred, then we could determine, we could assume that a head cut formed at that time. And so that, that is an active area of research. We, we want to look at um, if we have repeat um, lighter data sets, or we know exactly when the head cut was formed, like with that cutoff um, being, uh, being formed, then yeah, we'd be able to calculate that. But that, that is an active area of research. All right, uh, one last question. Would this analysis be pretty, and this is from Lisa French, I'm sorry. Would this analysis be pretty applicable to other Kansas streams or is this very specific to the Tuttle drainage? So I wanna say this is pretty specific to the Tuttle watershed due to the fact that there are no large impoundments upstream of Tuttle, whereas other um, impoundments in the, uh, uh, within Kansas have you know, impoundments in the upstream watershed. So um, I, I do want to say that it's probably unique to Tuttle, although um, as far as, you know, grade control and bank erosion, you know, we, we probably see some pretty similar characteristics when we look at the other watersheds. So um, my initial answer would be it'd be pretty unique, but I would be interested to see if we were to compare this to Perry or Milford or Kannapolis, um, what the comparison would be. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone for your questions. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to the next presenter. Um, the next presenter is John Shelley with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And the topic or the title of his presentation is Reservoir Sediment Management in Lake Solutions. John, uh, Dr. John Shelley is a hydraulic sedimentation engineer at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Kansas City District. Dr. Shelley has analyzed reservoir sedimentation impacts and management methods at multiple reservoirs and is currently engaged in analysis of sedimentation on 17 reservoirs in the Kansas River Basin. Dr. Shelley co-instructs the course sedimentation modeling course and has planned and carried out specific trainings on reservoir sediment management for engineers, regulators, planners, and managers in multiple countries and across the United States. Dr. Shelley received his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Kansas and a bachelor's of science in civil engineering from Brigham Young University. 
All right, John, I will turn it over to you. Uh, John, are you planning to bring up a presentation? Uh, can can folks hear me on the phone? Yeah, you're coming through, Laura. Okay. Yes. Uh, John Shelley, are you on the line? Laura, I'm not seeing him in the uh, participant breakout room participant area. Okay, well, um, I will email him, but I will maybe Josh Olson, if it's all right with you, I will skip to you. And then if John, John may be having technical issues, I'll check with him. But um, Josh, if you want to go ahead and give yours, I guess uh, we can, we can try that. Yeah, that Sorry. works. Sorry about that, folks. I'll uh, pull up my presentation here, Clay. And I will just quickly give your bio um, while you're pulling up your presentation, Josh. Josh Olson is a water resource planner and the project coordination lead of the Kansas Water Office. He is involved with a variety of groundwater and surface water monitoring research and assessment projects evaluating water quantity and quality throughout the state of Kansas with a focus on water supply and sedimentation. Prior to joining the Kansas Water Office, Josh received master's degrees in hydrogeology and water resources management from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a bachelor's degree in geology with an emphasis in hydrogeology and water chemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Euclair. Josh is passionate about meeting water supply needs through effective planning and sustainment management of water resources. All right, well, thank you, Laura. Um, hopefully we can get John on. I know he has some good information to share too, but I'll get into my, uh, my topic. Uh, I'll be discussing uh, water injection dredging today. Um, we've been talking obviously about the sedimentation issue um, and methods for dealing with that. And so this is um, an exciting, new technology or new application of this technology. Um, and I'll be talking specifically about a demonstration at Tuttle Creek Lake that we have been pursuing. So uh, just to set some context here, um, Tuttle Creek Reservoir, Tuttle Creek Lake um, is directly above Manhattan and it is the primary water supply reservoir for the Kansas River region. Um, as we've been discussing, it has sedimentation issues. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, sediment coming into Tuttle Creek Reservoir in orange, those bars um, for each month of the year. Uh, and then you have sediment going out of Tuttle Creek Reservoir in green. And then the blue represents the sediment that is staying in Tuttle. And Tuttle has a very high trapping efficiency um, above 90% of what's coming into Tuttle is staying in Tuttle. And, that results in about 3,800 acre feet per year of sediment or about 6 million cubic yards. So um, just a tremendous amount of sediment coming into the reservoir. Um, and when we look at this uh, through time, it's having major impacts on the conservation pool. So here you have um, 1957 on the, on the left there, shortly after construction of Tuttle. Um, and then 2020 on the right, uh, the most recent bathymetric survey that was just done in 2020. Um, and you can see Tuttle literally shrinking, um, those upper reaches just filling up with sediment, losing that, um, that supply, use, losing that water supply storage, um, and obviously lots of issues associated with that. We've actually lost about half of the original conservation pool um, since construction with all that sediment. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is a major water supply reservoir. Uh, so this, this has major implications for the Kansas River Basin um, and water users um, in that region. Um, there's uh, multiple uh, municipal water suppliers with direct intakes on the Kansas River and a lot of um, water use coming from that system. Um, and so here you can see this is storage at each of those reservoirs, uh, Milford, Tuttle, Perry, and Clinton. 
Um, and then um, demand projections. Um, in red, you have the higher demand projection. In black, you have the lower demand. Um, and just based on uh, potential variation in how much water use is required in the future. Um, but again, uh, you can see these crossover points, which represent uh, the point at which we would have insufficient supply to meet our flow targets in a 1950 style drought. Um, and you can see that occurring um, between 2064 and 2071. So um, not really not that far off um, from where we're at right now. Um, in addition to the, the water supply issue, uh, additional downstream impacts uh, include um, issues related to the sediment load reductions caused by all these reservoirs. Um, so the Corps actually did a study a few years ago looking at sediment load um, in the Kansas River system prior to um, building all of these reservoirs. Um, and you can see that on the right, it included uh, the whole system upstream uh, reservoirs as well. Um, but the pre-dam sediment load is about 44 million tons per year, and the post-dam sediment loads or current conditions uh, more like 13 million tons per year. Um, so you're talking about a 70% reduction in sediment transport in the Kansas River, um, so really significantly impacted by uh, the presence of all of those reservoirs in the system. Um, and that has implications um, both with downstream waterways, um, like the Missouri River and further downstream, where um, you see sediment deficits within um, those waterways as they're getting less sediment um, making its way from upstream. Um, and it's also had implications for native fish species. Um, this is something that um, has been looked at and being studied now. Uh, and there's been uh, declines in native fish species that are more um, were developed for uh, under those more turbid conditions or more adapted to those more turbid conditions, um, like the plains minnow and um, certain varieties of chub minnows, as well as some other species uh, that are not doing as well uh, with this reduced sediment load, uh, less turbid conditions in the system. Um, and so there's a very clear uh, deviation from the natural conditions. Um, so obviously with all of that sediment, it's causing issues uh, to uh, Tuttle in terms of losing water supply storage. It's um, keeping that sediment from reaching downstream reaches it traditionally would have. Uh, we need to figure out what we can do. And so uh, the traditional method of traditional dredging uh, with disposal in a confined disposal facility, this is what we did at John Redmond. Um, we have 3,800 acre feet in, in, uh, of sediment coming into Tuttle's multi-purpose pool each year. So to use that traditional dredging method, um, it would cost about $41 million per year. And that's using the cost at John Redmond, which is about 667 per cubic yard as our estimate. Um, and, and that, honestly, that cost system is probably uh, quite low, uh, partially based on uh, the fact that, you know, John Redmond, uh, generally uh, probably had more uh, land directly adjacent to the dam area um, for the disposal facilities than you would find for Tuttle. Um, and the cost increases as you use up disposal facilities and have to go farther and farther from the reservoir, um, as well as just you know, limited availability of land um, being an expense uh, and an issue as well. Um, and, and the other issue with this traditional dredging method is that it doesn't actually address um, that sediment deficit downstream. So with that in mind, uh, we started uh, having conversations with uh, the Corps, trying to figure out what are our options. You know, that 41 million a year just sounds pretty unpalatable. It's a, an incredibly high expense. What alternative measures could we use to get this sediment out of Tuttle? And that led us um, to water injection dredging. Uh, and water injection dredging, essentially all you're doing as you're lowering, lowering down a series of valves and pumping water out of them, um, high volumes, low velocities, directly into the uh, reservoir bed or the sediment bed um, and creating a density current. You're stirring up that sediment um, and, and refluidizing it um, and essentially creating a layer of more dense fluid, uh, sediment rich fluid um, that would say, sit along the uh, bed. And the idea with reservoirs, it's never been done before with a reservoir, um, is that if you had a low level outlet, you could just open the gates. So you pump this water into the sediment bed, stir up the sediment, let it flow to the low level outlet, and then just release it during normal operations. 
Um, and th again, that's a new application of an existing technology. Water injection dredging up to this point has been used in sediment management, um, but it's been more for um, maintaining channels and docks and harbor areas. Um, and so the application in a reservoir has never been done, um, but it's, a, it's an exciting um, potential application. So just to kind of give you a visual of what that would look like, this is a lab demonstration that the core did. Um, if you just imagine that that red layer is the density current, you'd be uh, resuspending that sediment um, and, that, and that density current would flow along the bottom of the reservoir. Um, you know, not, there's that distinct separation of the less dense uh, water above and that density current flows along the bottom to that low level outlet um, and could just be released during normal operations. Um, and so Tuttle was identified as a site that where this technology um, could potentially be utilized and could be successful. Um, and really the three uh, primary things that you need to look at, um, at in applying it for this context is uh, you need a low level outlet if you wanna just release during normal operation so that turbidity current can follow the bottom of the reservoir right to the outlet. Um, you need sediment that is uh, acceptably uncontaminated so that you're not causing water quality impacts by resuspending it and releasing it downstream. And you need sediment that is sufficiently fine um, so that when you inject that water into it, um, it is refluidizable so you can create that density current and get that density current moving towards the outlet. So with that in mind, um, with Tuttle identified as a potential candidate for this, um, we have gotten to work on uh, looking at those three criteria, we know we have the low level outlet. So it's really about um, looking at the sediment and um, is it acceptably uncontaminated and is it sufficiently fluidizable? Uh, so to do that, we had the Kansas Biological Survey go out and uh, a couple of times have collected uh, sediment and water samples as well as sediment cores um, to use in our various analyses. Um, so a lot of appreciation for the work they did. Um, you can see them out there, the crew uh, busy at work. So that was uh, helpful. And we took those samples and we sent in, um, really have done two water quality analyses. Um, one was just sending in the sediment itself to have that analyzed for these various parameters. Um, and this parameter list was developed in coordination um, with KDHE, as well as conversations with other stakeholders, um, specifically what parameters we needed to be considering um, as we were going through this process. Um, so we did the sediment analysis, looking at these things in sedi the sediment itself. And then we also have done an elutriate test, uh, which is taking a water sample from Tuttle and a sediment sample from Tuttle. Um, and then you look at, uh, or you analyze that water sample um, as it is directly from the reservoir. And then um, after you get that information, then you add um, the sediment and you resuspend the sediment into that sample. Um, you aerate it, and then you let the sediment settle back out and um, take another measurement of the water after interacting with the sediment um, to see how it was impacted uh, by having that suspended sediment um, within it. So pretty close analog to the concept of creating a density current and seeing what having that sediment resuspended could potentially do um, to the water quality. Um, Oh, and I guess I should, I should mention with those two, uh, we uh, found that the impacts from those two analyses were generally acceptable. Um, and so that was a box that um, we checked in terms of looking at um, sufficiently uncontaminated sediment um, as sort of a background research step. So then the next step uh, would be looking at, is the sediment sufficiently fluidizable? And so we've been working with the Engineering Research uh, Design Center uh, which is a, um, a unit within the Corps of Engineers out of Mississippi, um, doing various analyses um, to see is the sediment at uh, Tuttle sufficiently fluidizable? Would it work? Could we actually inject water into it and create a, uh, um, a functional density current? And so one of the things they did was just a basic um, you know, property analysis breakdown, looking at percent fines versus percent sand. Um, plastic limits, things like that, to, to try to assess that. And you can see here with these samples that it's almost entirely clay and silt. And if you were to move up, I will say, if you move up within the reservoir, um, sort of to the top of it, if you looked at the delta, you certainly would find more sand. Um, but within the lower part of the reservoir itself and sort of the main part of the reservoir, you really see a lot of clay and silt 
um, within the main body of it. And that's great for uh, WID because fines tend to be fluidizable. Um, so with that in mind then, um, Erdic also performed a, and then and we'll see if you can see this, a fluidization test. Um, five, so what they, this four, is a sample of Tuttle three, Creek uh, two, Lake sediment, one, and they're just five. injecting water into that sample, mimicking the WID process. And so they'll, they'll uh, keep that water flowing for a, a given amount of time, and they'll measure how much uh, of the sediment was refluidized um, as an assessment uh, as to its suitability for WID. Um, and one of the things I'll point out here, um, you, you can see that as it's being refluidized, um, it's actually settling down. You see that density current or that more dense um, sediment rich fluid going to the bottom. Um, and it's not just mixing throughout, even within this small tank, it's not covering the entire tank. It's, it's um, sinking down and hovering on the bottom That's of nice. the tank. Um, and this is uh, an important aspect of WID that by doing Five, high volumes four, of water three, and um, low velocities, four, rather than disrupting um, the entire water column, um, they found that the WID density current tends to stay within roughly the bottom five feet. Um, so it's not, you know, if you're injecting the water in um, to the sediment bed, it's not like you would expect to see these large clouds of um, sediment rich water making its way all the way to the surface, you know, tens of feet. Um, above the sediment bed, um, it tends to stay along the bottom, um, and and that's a benefit as it's you know less disruptive in terms of the full water column. And as you can see here, this just demonstrates that that Tuttle sediment uh, was very fluidizable. This was an exciting thing when they sent this video, um, just showing its ability um, to be refluidized and potentially work for width. So this is a very positive step for us. Um, so with that in mind, you know, looking at was it sufficiently uncontaminated, was it sufficiently fluidizable, um, we also wanted to think about uh, where is the sediment itself going to end up, um, both within the reservoir and downstream. And so um, one effort that's been ongoing is um, a the development of a sediment transport model for the Kansas River. Um, and, and the Corps has been working on this and they're um, in the process of refining it so that we can run scenarios to see where we might anticipate um, sediment going. Um, I will say, that, you know, the process of WID, since it really targets those finer sediments, um, the thought is that they would be fine enough that they would stay suspended, um, go from the Big Blue into the Kansas all the way to the Missouri. Um, and, and that's, um, the thought is that it would just continue its way down the system, because um, it's fine enough, it should stay resuspended. Um, but obviously, we want to verify that to, to try to think about um, where it will end up. Another um, uh, effort that we did to try to think about uh, sediment movement was taking AD, ADCP velocity measurements uh, within the reservoir itself. So looking at um, under varying release rates, is, are there spots where there's higher velocity of flow within the reservoir, um, which might be preferential flow areas if we, when we do the demonstration. Um, and they found slightly higher velocities north, near the bottom of the reservoir, but generally it was just within about 40 feet from the inlet uh, of the gates that they saw it. So um, another effort to look at how the sediment uh, or the density current will move. Um, so with all that in mind, um, doing a lot of that background research, trying to check the, the right boxes about what, we're, what um, we should be thinking about for suitability for WID at Tuttle. Um, We've been working on the monitoring plan development, um, and that includes uh, what we've already done in terms of water quality testing with the sediment itself and the elutriate testing I mentioned, um, as well as downstream monitoring at USGS gauges. Some of that is currently in place and has been in place. Um, some other things, measures that we've talked about doing uh, are uh, the ADCP or acoustic Doppler current profiler monitoring to look at the sediment plume. Um, Erdic uh, has actually, I believe they have acquired or in the process of acquiring that equipment. Um, and so um, the intention is for them to use that to monitor um, the plume uh, during the demonstration. We also plan to do in like turbidity monitoring and then um, pre and post demonstration bathymetric surveys to look at how it actually impacted uh, storage. Um, we'll look at dam safety monitoring um, and then big blue river cross sections looking downstream um, at you know, potential erosional or depositional impacts. Um, and we have a, a number of cross sections that have already been collected, but wanting to do that as well with the demonstration. 
Um, and one other thing I'll add too is, um, as I mentioned before, about the impacts to native species. I know there have been some fish surveys that have been completed within the Kansas River, um, and I believe um, there will be some level of coordination um, trying to look at that as well with the demonstration. Um, as I mentioned, downstream monitoring has been in place. Um, we want to establish baseline suspended sediment, turbidity, specific, specific conductance, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, organic carbon, and nutrients. Um, trying to make sure we're checking all the boxes in terms of potential impacts from WID downstream. Um, and we have three gauge locations um, at Wamigo, Topeka, and DeSoto that already are looking at turbidity and specific conductance. Um, at, at, that we could use as a reference in terms of background conditions at those locations. Um, we added a gauge directly downstream of Tuttle um, near uh, Manhattan on the Big Blue River um, and had a variety of parameters that we were looking at there. Um, again, developed that, um, that parameter list or monitoring list um, through discussions with stakeholders and trying to identify um, what would potentially be important to um, you know, ecological impacts will be important to water suppliers and things that they'll have to think about in their treatment processes. Um, and we had that in place um, for a year or two um, and had to suspend that monitoring last October due to financial limitations. Um, however, that will be reestablished, that gauge will be reestablished um, closer to uh, the demonstration date. So you're probably thinking as we're talking through all this, uh, what's this going to cost? Well, um, we worked out. Um, an estimate with the core um, for the total demonstration of $4.1 million, which includes um, the cost of the dredging system itself, um, permitting and environmental compliance considerations, um, with equipment, construction and operation, and thinking along the lines of a three month demonstration. So you'd um, have it on the water during the flood season to try to make use of um, regular releases when there's potentially more water to move through the reservoir. Um, and, and then additional things like engineering and operational analyses, obviously um, quite extensive monitoring um, during the operation of the WID and, and that whole demonstration. And then of course, um, demobilization and post project reporting, um, closing it out well. Uh, so that takes us to next steps where we're at. Um, we've been working a lot on uh, figuring out how to fund the project. Um, obviously we've done a lot of background research, but. Um, the funding uh, for the 4.1 million, that's a significant hurdle that we've been um, working to uh, address um, for, for this throughout this whole process. Um, and the state of Kansas actually appropriated $150,000 um, in FY21, um, as well as $975,000 in FY22 towards the project. Um, so we currently have uh, approximately 1.1 million in state funding that has been appropriated for this demonstration. Um, we've also been working with the core, um, trying to uh, find potential sources of federal funding to, to um, put towards the demonstration at, as well. Um, and there are currently requests out for up to the full 4.1 million in um, federal support. Um, and we'll see how those turn out. So, um, you know, various efforts in the works and continuing to try to raise that full 4.1 million. Um, we are working with the core on a research and development report, basically just going through all of these different efforts and, and background research and considerations that we've been addressing um, as we've been pursuing the demonstration and incorporating that into just one um, neat compiled document um, that will include um, some more in-depth um, information in the appendices, like lab results and things like that, um, to share with stakeholders just to try to give everyone as much information as possible. Um, and, and um, you know, let, let everyone into um, where we're at with the project right now. Um, and at that point then, uh, we plan to um, go into some stakeholder outreach, um, try to get um, you know, some feedback in terms of where we're at and people's thoughts on um, the demonstration and everything. And uh, with that in mind, then uh, we are working on and we'll continue working on the development of the monitoring and implementation plans um, and intend for that stakeholder outreach to help inform the development of those plans as well. Um, so with that, I guess I'll ask if there's any questions. Josh, um, I guess John Shelley is on the line now and we have about 10 more minutes allotted for this session. I'm hoping that, I know there is a break in between this session and the next concurrent session, 
Um, but ho I'm hoping folks might be willing to stay on and listen to John's presentation in its entirety and um, take some questions about your presentation and his at the end, because there are a number of questions in the chat. Yeah, that's if fine. Folks are okay with that, I'll just um, go ahead and let John give his presentation. And John, Shelley, thank you for joining. And um, I've already given your bio, and uh, so I think you're set up and ready to go. Okay, uh, can, can everybody hear me? Yes. And uh, can you see my, can you see my slide I show? See, I see it coming up, yes, yes. Okay, all right, my, and my apologies for the, uh, for the mix up there, but uh, thank you for, for holding on. Um, I'm John Shelley from the Kansas City District, and I'm gonna talk about some in-lake solutions for reservoir sediment management. I'm Josh, just talked about one, about which we're really excited. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, several uh, others. And if you've been here the whole session, you've seen us before, but um, just in case anyone new is, is joining in, you know, we've got a real problem, um, Tuttle Creek Lake, you know, within about 60 years, there's basically no multipurpose pool left. Um, and all the lakes are filling in to some degree, although Tuttle is the worst. Um, Dr. Roland Hotchkiss at a previous water conference a couple years ago said the only sustainable way to manage the nation's reservoirs is to pass the sediment downstream. Um, anything else is just so astronomically expensive that it just can't, it really just can't be done. And so um, I'm going to talk about drawdown flushes, dredging with downstream discharge, and hydrosuction. And I saw there was a, a question about hydrosuction in the chat. So I'm going to talk about those, and, and thank you, Josh, for talking about um, water injection dredging. Okay, so a drawdown flush is um, you, you, you drain the entire lake. So the water pool uh, level drops, and then you run it like a river for some period of time. And as you're running it like a river, it'll cause lots of erosion to occur in those previous sediment deposits and a very high sediment discharge rate um, while you're running it like a river. Okay, hopefully this movie will work. This is a physical model of this process. It's in Wuhan, China, Wuhan of COVID. This, uh, after they drop the water level, you see that erosion of those previous sediment deposits in this um, sort of simulated reservoir. Okay, and and uh, here's another example. Some of you have probably seen this one before. This is a lake um, in Nebraska. And um, this, this dam has actually since failed. But they, they did this operation for about 80 years. And they would do a drawdown. And then you see the erosion that occurs um, in those previous sediment deposits um, when they do that drawdown. Um, here's another example, which I, I'm not going to play, but uh, you can later, if you want, look at this uh, YouTube site here. And this was actually a, a, a dam removal project um, in the United States. And the, um, um, but they drained the lake and ran it like a river before they removed the dam. And so you can see what happens in the lake as that sediment erodes um, and, uh, and then transports downstream. Okay, so this, um, so how effective might a drawdown flush be at Tuttle Creek Lake? There are obviously very um, in-depth ways to look at it, and then there are simpler ways. This is a simpler way. Each of these dots represents a drawdown flush at another reservoir, and most of these are, are reservoirs in China. But each, uh, each dot represents one of those drawdown flush events, and then there's some simple parameters about the slope of the sediment and the width that it erodes to and the type of material. And you can see where Tuttle Creek Lake would fall on this line and then how much sediment that would, uh, you know, would, would transport downstream. And so we took that equation and we took the period of, of you know, record for flow that we had and we reran that all those flows to see what uh, this kind of a drawdown flush could do. Now, most of the time, drawdown flushes are done in small lakes, and they can be, you know, flushed for a couple weeks, and then they can be filled back up quickly. Tuttle being a very large lake, that, that it would have to be drawn down. That would take some time, and then you run it like a river for a while, and then it would fill back up. So this is a four-month flush. So for March, 
um, all the way through the end of June and the first of July. But the, uh, what the equation tells, tells us is that on average, we could get 9,800 acre feet of sediment to leave Tuttle Creek Lake by doing a flush like this. Some years it's actually much, much higher. Um, and then some years, not at all. If there's too much water in the lake, it just rains too much in this time period, you can never get it drawn all the way down, then you, don't, you can't do a flush at all. Um, but on average, 9,800 acre feet, which is pretty good, right? That's about, you know, roughly you know, two and a half times the, uh, the annual sediment load. Now there's a common limiting factor in a lot of these flushes and that's that you'll flush out a channel like we see here, merged floodplain, that sediment gets stranded. As the water level drops and you run it like a river, now the water's confined to a river channel. And, uh, and so those sediments are stranded and they don't really get eroded. Um, in Tuttle Creek Lake, uh, about 10 years ago, USGS did a report looking at the deposition, was deposition in the channel. And um, so if we assume that same ratio has, you know, hold, held in place since 1999, then there will, there's 13.6 thousand acre feet of sediment deposited in the channel now. And that would be what a flush would be able to get is really that sediment in the channel. And if we took our projections and we assumed that same, um, you know, uh, what did I say, same 26%, then um, over the next 50 years, there would be 57,000 acre feet that would deposit in, in the channel that could be maintained then by flushing. So basically what we're saying is um, we could maintain 26% of the lake storage by flushing every eight years um, on average. So that's, uh, you know, could be, could be very effective, certainly very cost effective. Um, and it's something that could be combined with other methods in order to make it more effective. It could be combined with the water injection dredging because you could water injection dredge the floodplain sediments down into the channel and then flush them. So there are things that could be done um, to combine it. There are definite pros and cons. Um, the benefits, of course, this is orders of magnitude less expensive than other options. This is the most common way to manage reservoir sediment in the entire world, like internationally, this is what is mostly done. Um, but as I said, it's it's mostly done with smaller lakes, more like hydropower lakes, um, for the reasons of you know you have to stay drawn down, and then it takes time to fill back up. Uh, you can get large sediment release. Don't need any infrastructure modifications. I mean, we've got low-level gates that can just be opened when the lake can be drained and they can be opened. Not every dam has that, but the ones in the Kansas River Basin do. Um, and then there could be some vegetation benefits of, of drawing down and, and allowing vegetation a chance to uh, to grow. Now, but there are definite drawbacks. This concentrates the sediment from you know maybe multiple years of sediment into a shorter time frame of, of you know three four months. And so that's higher than natural. Um, the lake fishery would be completely flushed downstream as well. So there would be no lake fishery and how long would that take to recover? Um, recreation impacts, of course, because you don't have a lake for those four months. And then, you know, there's time for it to fill back up again. And then there's drought risk. So, you know, if you needed the water and you were drawn down, um, then the water's not available, obviously. So there, there are definite drawbacks they aren't things that are impossible hurdles. Um, there are things that maybe could be done to, mi to mitigate some of these risks or impacts. Um, but really, the uh, I suppose the cost would be involved in, in mitigating impacts, not so much in the operation itself. OK, the second idea is dredging with a downstream um, discharge. Yeah, yeah. John, John Shelley, I just want to interrupt you for just one minute. It, I did get a, a flash message that said that the breakout is supposed to end in one minute and that it's possible it, they, that the breakout room might be closed. I think, so I, a, Laura, I, I think he has till 9.30, so five minutes real quick. <laughs> okay, all right. There you go. Okay. Yeah, five minutes, yeah. John. Okay, thank you. And I, and I, and I apologize for the, the issues here, but all right. You could dredge and put the sediment downstream. Um, and you have a lot of control over that. There's been some cost estimating done by this uh, company, Anchor QEA. And they give a range for this sort of an operation 
up to about four dollars per cubic yard, which which is about half price of, of like a John Redmond style operation, but still very expensive for Tuttle, maybe twenty five million dollars per year if you wanted to, to do this and only this to uh, maintain the sediment. OK, and then hydrosuction, which there's some questions about about hydrosuction. In its simplest form, hydrosuction is a siphon and uh, and in a small dam, you can go up and over um, a dam. And that will work for a small dam, and it has been done in the United States. Through a large dam, you can't go up and over. There's a physical limit on, on the pressure in the pipe um, dropping too low. And so you have to go through the dam in order to get that, the benefit of the, uh, of the head difference driving the suction. This has been done. There's a, a, a reservoir in Guatemala. And this kind of gives you the setup here with the barge. And they connect it to an existing conduit, and, uh, and they were able to with relatively simple equipment and not a big crew compared to a dredging project that has you know quite a few people involved and, and equipment with lots of moving parts. This ha is relatively simple. It still requires people and it still requires moving this barge around, but they were able to then move the barge around and suck out and pass a lot of sediment downstream. Um, we've looked at this now and I'll thank uh, like, colleague Nathan Chrisman for doing um, these analyses, but we've looked at it in Perry and Tuttle Creek Lake and Canopolis, um, and actually in all of the uh, Kansas River Basin lakes and in John Redmond, and, and have seen how effective this might be, how much sediment we could get to, uh, to leave the lakes. And in each of these examples I'm going to show you here, it, it's three pipes that then uh, go from one side of the uh, dam to the other and discharge in the downstream channel. This shows you the gray dots are the incoming sediment load and their concentration. And there's a range of incoming sediment. And this shows that the um, we can stay within the, the realm of the natural incoming sediment concentrations. Right now, the sediment leaving the lake is unnaturally clear. But if we use that upstream, what, what's coming in is a limit. And we start one pipe when we're at 750 CFS of lake discharge, and then start the next pipe when the discharge increases, and the next pipe when the discharge increases. We could stay within that sort of natural realm of uh, sediment concentrations. This shows uh, the lake pool and the volume going down over time at Canopolis with no sediment management and with the hydrosuction in place the way that we've described it here. This would be the uh, the volume over time. So. Canopolis, it could do very well maintaining the volume over 100 years. You'd still lose a little bit. Um, and this shows at Perry, sort of a, a similar story. And then this shows at Tuttle Creek. Because, uh, you know, like I say, around 60-ish years out, there's basically no lake left. Um, and hydrosection can't quite keep up on its own with the incoming sediment loads. Um, but there's still a pretty big difference. By 50 years out, um, with hydrosection in place, we still have 112 um, thousand acre feet, and without it, in 50 years, there's been you know, about 35,000 acre feet. But if you keep going another decade after the 50 years, then you you sunk down to almost nothing. And there's still room for combining hydrosuction with other things, because at the highest discharges, hydrosuction is not keeping up with the incoming sediment loads. So there's still uh, there still would be room to do something like uh, you know combining it with dredging or water injection. 